Um, where do you do you want it just opened? Yeah, you can just, uh, I can just leave that there. Uh, you can just put it in the uh, okay. in the where in the uh, Wednesday folder. Um, it'll be uh, okay. back when yeah. it's like okay. desktop um, presentation. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay, we should all be in Wednesday. Okay, yep. Uh oh, I, I don't see my presentation here. Uh. Oh. Yeah. I put it on the last right. Yeah. But you gave it to the guy right now, didn't you? Yeah. I don't know why I took it. right now? No, it's not there. You have flashlight? I don't have a flashlight. I can put it on the one that's there. Yeah. Look at your computer, you mean? Oh, no, so no, I, I don't know who's this. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Maybe that wasn't a flashlight. Sorry? Wait. Yeah, the breath. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Thank you, John. Using it. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Let's start the session. Just for everyone to be sure where you are, because sometimes we entered the wrong room. I did it today, so I just realized that I was in the wrong room five minutes after the first presentation and said, well, there's something strange here. So you're on the red bud, 
and it's a session about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's where we are right now, so don't get lost. <laughs> so my name is Carlos. Uh, some of you already have the pleasure to meet here and to be really so far three very, very happy days for me meeting so many people and get to know all, all of you. And uh, so let's start with the first presentation. It will be evaluation of a water arsenic filter in a participatory intervention to reduce arsenic exposure in American Indian communities. Strong Heart Water Study with Christine Marie, Christine Marie George from John Hopkins Institute. Please, Christine. Just... There we go. Thank you, Carlos. And so thank you everyone for attending my presentation today. It's my pleasure to present on our work with the Strong Heart Water Study to design participatory interventions to reduce arsenic exposure in American Indian communities. My name is Christine Marie George and I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins. And so I wanted to start my presentation by acknowledging Tracy Zakar. And so she's the, the lead author for today's presentation. And she's also prepared a publication based on this work. She's the project coordinator for the Strong Heart Water Study. And so the rationale behind our work is that in North America, it's estimated that there are over 2 million individuals exposed to elevated arsenic in drinking water that exceeds the EPA maximum contaminant level of 10 micrograms per liter. And today's presentation focuses on private well users because the EPA does not have mandates for private well users. So the, the onus is on the private well user to ensure that their well is arsenic safe. And as you can see here uh, from the map from the U.S. Geological Survey, there's many areas in the U.S. that are either in orange or red that have arsenic that exceeds the EPA MCL and more than 25% of the samples collected. And the black circles here are showing the Strong Heart Water Study communities. So the Strong Heart Study is a long-standing uh, cohort study which is following American Indian communities for over 25 years, investigating risk factors for cardiovascular diseases. And so you can see there's partner communities across North America, um, in the Four Corners area, the Great Plains, um, and in Oklahoma. And so as part of the Strong Heart study, urine samples are collected. And urinary arsenic serves as a biomarker of chronic arsenic exposure. And so this led to the opportunity to investigate the health implications of chronic arsenic exposure within these communities that were in the Strong Heart study. And so this work was led by Dr. Ana Navas Asian in partnership with the American Indian communities in the Strong Heart study. And it was found that chronic arsenic exposure was associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer mortality, diabetes and kidney disease within these American Indian communities. And so these findings demonstrated the health implications of chronic arsenic exposure in the strong heart study communities. So the objective of our work today for the strong heart water study is to develop and evaluate participatory interventions to reduce arsenic exposure in these American Indian communities. And for this project, it's a, a multi-sectorial collaboration, which the data collection activities are led by Missouri Bricks, which is an American Indian owned and run research organization. Our partners are also staff and government officials within our partner, American Indian Nations, including the Water Resource Department, the Tribal Water Utility, and the Tribal Housing Authority. And we also partner with Indian Health Service, and our collaboration is led by Captain David Harvey, who's here today, and includes receiving technical support on selection of arsenic mitigation technologies, as well as financial support for the installation of the arsenic removal devices for this project. In addition, we partnered with a local laboratory, which is Mid-Continent Laboratory, to do the water arsenic testing for the the work for this study, um, and also our academic partners, which include ourselves at Johns Hopkins, um, 
Columbia, as well as MedStar that have contributed to the analysis of data, both from the formative research, as well as from the randomized control trial. So now I'll go into our work to develop the Strong Heart Water Study interventions. And so this was a community-centered design for intervention development, which included semi-structured interviews with community stakeholders, private well users, uh, officials working within tribal government, promoters, health promoters in the community and elders um, to identify the facilitators and barriers uh, to the use of arsenic safe water. We also had community workshops where community members met together to discuss their priorities related to drinking water and to draft recommendations for intervention development. So here I show an example of a product from the community workshops where community members rank their priorities related to water in their community. And you can see that very high on the list was communication of water testing results, as well as education. They wanted education around water quality and particular arsenic exposure within the community. And so here I show the conceptual framework uh, for the development of the Strong Heart Water Study interventions. And the development of this framework was led by Dr. Elizabeth Thomas, the behavioral scientist at Johns Hopkins. And it's a multi-level approach that was taken for intervention development due to the multifaceted um, concerns and considerations that need to go into the development of an arsenic mitigation program. So when thinking about the structural level, you think about the tribal government, and their potential role in arsenic mitigation program. Um, for example, policies around arsenic mitigation, considering water rights in terms of identifying arsenic safe water sources within the community. And then when thinking at the community level, it's important to consider access to water arsenic testing because without knowing if one's well is contaminated, you can't take action um, to install a removal device. And then when thinking at the household level, thinking about what types of technologies can be implemented to reduce arsenic exposure. Should they be point of entry? Should they be point of use devices? How do you encourage sustained use of the devices over time? Um, as well as considering the financial needs of the households, are they able to afford an arsenic filter? How will you ensure that arsenic safe water will be obtained over time? Uh, how households access arsenic cartridges. So taking all those factors into consideration when developing an arsenic mitigation program, as well as at the individual level. So things like the aesthetic quality of the water is important. We found that in our partner communities, some individuals could have been connected to the municipal water supply, which was arsenic safe, but they chose not to because they didn't trust the taste of the water. It had a chlorine taste. And also the temperature was different than what they were used to from their wells where the water was much colder. So these are all factors that are important to take into consideration when developing um, an arsenic mitigation program in our study setting. So now I'll go into the interventions and that were implemented as part of the Strong Heart Water Study. And so we implemented in partnership with the community, a community water arsenic testing program where community members collected water samples from private wells and they were sent to a local laboratory uh, for water arsenic testing. A third of the wells were found to have arsenic that was above the EPA MCL. And to align with the community's needs to have a better understanding of the communication of water arsenic testing results, um, maps were developed that were anonymized that showed the distribution of arsenic across the community. For households that were found to have elevated arsenic, a community plumber that was employed by the Tribal Housing Authority installed an arsenic removal device in their home, which was a point of use device that went under the sink, as you can see here. Um, so the arsenic cartridge is under the sink, it filters the water, and then the water comes out of the filter faucet that's here at the top. The kitchen faucet um, continues to be functional to allow households to use it for things such as washing their hands and washing their dishes, since we wanted to try to sustain the life of the cartridge for as long as possible. 
In addition, when the community plumbers went and installed the arsenic removal devices, they provided one replacement arsenic cartridge along with an instruction manual. In addition, through our formative research, uh, other interventions were developed, including a mobile health program, which were calls from community members reminding households to use their filter faucet for both drinking and cooking. And through our formative research, we identified that some households thought that boiling water removed arsenic, even though it actually concentrates it. Um, and we also found that some households or some individuals thought that using water with elevated arsenic for cooking was okay. So our health communication program targeted um, these uh, key factors contributing to people's use of the filter faucet. So we had videos as well, which were testimonials from community members on why they decided to use our arsenic removal device provided as part of the intervention. Um, there were also text messages sent and videos were shared using YouTube um, as well as Facebook. Um, our final behavior that we focused on as part of the Strong Heart Water Study program um, was changing the arsenic removal device cartridge. And so um, the cartridges don't last forever. Um, based on our calculation, we recommended that households uh, should use their cartridge for 12 months. And so the community members created a video on um, how to change the cartridge and households were also called as to remind them to change their cartridge. So we conducted a randomized control trial of the Strong Heart Water Study, and this was the first randomized control trial of an arsenic mitigation intervention in the U.S. Um, we had 50 households. Um, we had plans to recruit more households, but then COVID hit, <laughs> and so we, we managed to recruit 50 households. We had two arms. The first arm received just the mobile health component of the study, which was three phone calls from a community member reminding them to drink and cook from the filter faucet and to change the cartridge along with the installation of the arsenic removal device by a community plumber. And this intervention was then compared to a more intensive arm, which had videos um, and also had home visits from a community promoter. And so now I'll go into our results. So we found that delivery of the intervention in both arms led to a large reduction in water arsenic coming out of the filter faucet where 93% of the filters at our two-year follow-up still reduced arsenic below the MCL of 10 micrograms per liter. So we only had three failures um, out of the 47 filters that were installed. In addition, um, this was similar between our two intervention arms. And when we looked at the percent reduction, the filters reduced 91% of the water arsenic that was present. And I just showed two box plots here of the water arsenic concentrations. And you can see the kitchen faucet water arsenic levels are much higher than the filter faucet. We found that 46% of households reported changing their arsenic removal device cartridge during the two year study period. And this was also similar between the two study arms. And then we were interested to see if there was temporal variability in the water arsenic concentrations from the kitchen faucet over time. And so this was an important research question for us, in particular for the community water arsenic testing program. Did we need to go back repeatedly to households to test their water for arsenic from their well over time? And if so, this would add substantially to the cost of the program. And so fortunately, we found that over our two-year study period, there was very little temporal variability in the water arsenic concentration, water arsenic concentrations from the, the kitchen faucet over time. So this meant that repeated testing um, of the water arsenic concentrations from the well was not needed in our study setting. So in summary, we found that 93% of the filters removed arsenic below the MCL um, at our final follow-up visit at our two-year time point. We found that 46% of households changed their filter cartridge, and we saw a limited temporal variability in what are arsenic concentrations from the kitchen faucet over time. So in terms of our important lessons learned, we learned the value of our multi-sectorial approach for program implementation, and particularly engaging community members, both in intervention development and in intervention implementation. In addition, we found that our mobile health program 
um, worked really well and that home visits weren't actually needed in our setting to reduce water arsenic exposure. And these findings complement our findings on urinary arsenic, um, which I actually just finished the data analysis uh, today. And we found that both of our study arms had significant reductions in urinary arsenic from baseline to follow-up. So the interventions reduced water arsenic as well as people's actually body burden of arsenic. And so with that, I would like to conclude my presentation um, and to thank you for your time and to acknowledge our study collaborators who contributed to the implementation of this study. Thank you. And so I may have time for one question. <laughs> Are there questions? Yes. So when we looked at urinary arsenic, um, the exposure was uh, similar between uh, the reduction in the arsenic exposure was similar between the two groups. In terms of the water arsenic, it was also. To us, it seems that the filters last longer than we thought. So we originally thought that they would only last for 12 months, but it seems like they're effective in reducing arsenic for a much longer period of time, which is, which is really promising. Are there other questions? Yes. Um, so outside of uh, our American Indian partner nations, I'm not really sure which activities are being implemented. Um, but within the communities, uh, I know that IHS has done testing, um, water arsenic testing, and then also as part of our community water arsenic testing program. But after um, Captain Harvey is here from Indian Health Services, he's over there, he could probably address some more questions about that. Um, are there other questions? Yes. Yeah, so IHS provided the financial support for the installation of the arsenic removal devices, um, as well as the cartridges. Yes, and that's a really important factor. And so there's community meetings that are going on now to discuss what the best approach is for that going forward, because that's an important part to ensure the sustainability of the program over time. I think I may be out of time, but I'll be happy to address any questions that you have after the presentations today. Thank you. Thank you so now let's go for the second presentation to be mecha mechanism for engagement of diverse people in participatory design for urban wash Indonesia and Fiji by Naomi Francis. Naomi, just see where the presentation here. Um, it's in the red. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, my name is Naomi Francis. I'm from Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, but I'm representing an amazing team from three other universities. So there's the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. Hassanuddin University in Indonesia and Emory University uh, here in the States. Um, our research is supported by an Australian grant called Water for Women, and it's attached to a broader program called RISE, which I'll explain further in a second. So what was the motivation for our study? Um, there's an issue identified in the WASH literature that we're not, uh, when we research and monitor and evaluate our WASH programs were very focused on the outcomes and the input, uh, the impacts, but we're not often documenting, or we're not documenting enough what, how the intervention uh, took place, whether whether we did what we said we did, what the actual intervention was itself, um, and in the context where where participatory approaches are increasingly being promoted for transformative WASH programs. It's really important that we define the mechanisms that are used to implement those approaches. So how we, we set out to do this in the context of the RISE program, which stands for the Revitalizing Informal Settlements and Their Environments. Um, it's a randomized control trial that's taking place in, in uh, Makassar, Indonesia and 
Suva in Fiji. Um, we've got six control and six intervention sites in each country. Um, and the hypothesis of the trial is that if we improve water infrastructure and wastewater management infrastructure, there'll be improvements in human and ecological health. I'm not gonna go into any more detail about RISE. There's some, some links I'll provide at the end, um, but the important uh, aspect for our project was that the water infrastructure and the wastewater infrastructure are being designed using a participatory approach or a co-design approach. And that just means that there are, as well as the des official designers, the non-official designers like the end users and local government are included in the process of the design. Um, so that led to our research question. What are the mechanisms that were used to engage diverse people in the RISE program? And by diverse, we meant uh, people or groups of people that might have specific needs. So that might be women, men, children, older people, people with disabilities, et cetera. Um, so because our study was focused on documenting the, the intervention side of the program, it falls within a field of study called implementation science. Um, there's lots of frameworks for analyzing interventions that are defined in implementation science, but we chose to use the consolidated framework for implementation research or CFER for short. And CFER defines five domains. So there's the intervention characteristic, characteristics, which is things like the, the cost of the program, the adaptability, flexibility, whether there was a pilot site done. Um, then there is the inner setting of the intervention, which is the organize, it's usually around who the implementation organization is and how they function. Then there's the outer setting, which is the context that the project takes place in. Um, then there are the characteristics of the individuals involved. And then there's a domain about the process. So um, the planning, engaging, executing and reflection of the project. So CIFRA was originally designed to be used in high income settings uh, and in like a like hospitals and clinical settings, um, but it was also intended to be adapted. And that's <clears> obviously what we did for our project because it's not a high income setting, it's not a clinical setting. Um, and we had to adapt it in two main ways. So the first was that, so under these five domains, there are subdomains. So there's a total of 39 subdomains called constructs. I'm not gonna go into what all those are. Um, but when you use CIFA, you're encouraged to pick the constructs that, that match your your area of study the best. And so we picked one construct per domain and I'll go into those when I talk about the findings. The other adaptation we did was um, around defining what the inner and the outer setting was. So in a hospital setting, it's very clear what the inner and outer setting is, but when you're in a participatory research program, that line becomes more blurred because the residents obviously become implementers as well as end users. And so we had to adapt some of the constructs for that. So we used CIFR to uh, create our question guides and we conducted interviews with the RISE program staff, with residents in both Fiji and Indonesia. And we did focus groups in, Indo in Fiji, but not in Indonesia because of uh, the pandemic. And the participants were sampled. So there was as much diversity as possible in terms of gender, uh, functionality, according to the Washington group questions, their settlement that they came from and their participation in RISE activities. And then we analyzed the transcripts um, according to the CFU domains. So there was a lot of data and I'm not gonna be able to go through all of it here. Um, I'm just gonna present some highlights and with the hope of showing how CFU can be used to, to describe an intervention. Um, I should also add that we, when we defined our mechanisms, we, defi we divided them into activities and approaches. So activities were, were the events and um, I guess the, the activities specifically that the RISE program uh, coordinated in each of the settlements and the approaches were more around the, the way those organized, those, the way the activities were, um, were managed and designed. So the approaches were more general and the activities were very specific to, to the context. Um, so in this first domain, the intervention characteristics, we chose the construct relative advantage um, which refers to stakeholders' perceptions of the relative advantage of this intervention over another similar intervention um, that's trying to address a similar issue. And 
one of the findings from the residents, both residents and staff mentioned this, but particularly from the residents, uh, they identified the household uh, level engagement as being a unique feature of RISE that they hadn't experienced in other water infrastructure programs in their communities before. And they really appreciated this level of engagement because it, it was intimate, it built trust, um, and the staff recognized that, that the household level visits were, an, were a really good way to engage people who, who couldn't come to the community level workshops. Um, and that was for various reasons. It might've been because they were working, looking after children. Um, some people had mobility issues, which meant that they couldn't come to community level meetings. They couldn't hear properly. And so a household level engagement was, was more fruitful um, or they felt, you know, some level of stigma and so they felt more comfortable talking to staff members directly rather than amongst their peers. Um, so in the outer setting domain we selected the construct resident needs and resources and one of the things one of the key approaches that was identified particularly by residents was the flexibility of the RISE program to to respond I guess to resident needs that fell outside the original mandate of the RISE program. And so when the COVID pandemic happened, obviously people um, couldn't, couldn't work as much. Um, some people were, had food security issues. And so RISE was able to respond to that. And in particular, they were able to respond to, to households that had mobility impairments so they could deliver the food if needed. Um, and so they were flexible enough to, to respond to the needs of the residents in that way. In the inner setting, we chose the construct culture. And this was one culture that we had to adapt to suit um, the difference between the RISE organization and the settlements themselves. Because obviously there is internal culture within the implementing organization, and then there is the culture within the settlements. And, and both of these impact how the intervention takes place. So one of the things that the staff identified in terms of culture within uh, the RISE organization itself was highlighted by the Fiji staff. And they noted that over the course of the project, um, they were given increasing responsibility and, and more value was placed on their, and on their expertise and knowledge of the local context. And, and they felt that this led to having more decision-making power um, in, in the sense that that transferred from the Australia US based staff to more to the Fiji based staff. Fiji -based staff. So it was a good example of of inclusion within the organization. Under the characteristics of individuals domain, we selected the con construct knowledge and beliefs about the intervention, which is um, people's, I guess, knowledge of what actually was going on, but also their attitudes to what was going on. And um, both, both the, the residents and the staff identified various approaches for making sure that the residents knew what was happening in their communities. And they did this in a, a multi-pronged approach to make sure um, the different groups of people were able to, to keep ahead of what was going on for them. And so that included um, letters, uh, household visits where verbal explanations could be made, community announcements at church, and um, some communication during the various assessment activities for the RCT process. Out of the last domain process, we selected the construct engaging. And this is really about how people are attracted to the program and how, how they are involved to the various activities to, to get people involved, which is possibly the most relevant construct to our, our research question. There are lots of activities and lots of approaches identified by residents and staff. Um, but one of the things again that stuck out was the rapport that was built between staff and residents. And again, one of the ways that this was done was the household visits. People mentioned this time and time again. Um, you know, it was a way of building trust and therefore rapport. Um, it meant that the residents could see the staff working on a regular basis and that, that also helped um, them to feel like RISE was really invested in, in their well-being, um, especially during COVID. So in terms of uh, the implications for research and practice. Um, our findings have been uh, developed into a toolkit and I'll provide a link at the end. So there's way more information in there, but some of the key points we have in there are that um, 
when looking at the mechanisms, we would recommend starting with the approaches and the activities will follow. So rather than grabbing a toolkit and picking a nice shiny activity that looks like fun, um, begin with the approaches because they're more general. Activities really needed to be tailored to the different context. And we found that that was a difference between Indonesia and Fiji. Having a diverse team was really important. That was identified by both residents and the staff. Um, the RISE program did really well in terms of having uh, a balance between male and female staff, which residents appreciated. Um, but the, the RISE program staff identified more of a need to, to engage directly with um, locally based organizations to balance the lack of diversity that we had in the team itself. Um, I feel like budget gets mentioned in every single presentation here. So, but it's, um, a genuine consideration, especially when you're talking about an intervention as resources intensive as, as RISE where you are visiting households on a regular basis. Um, we found that CIFAR was a really useful framework for the analysis of water in infrastructure programs. So in trying to address that gap in the WASH literature, um, it's a very easy to use tool and, it, and it's very easy to adapt it. So it can be as complex or as simple as you, you want it to be. Um, I want to acknowledge all the participants and the rest of my amazing team. And there is some more information here about the toolkit and RISE. If you're interested, I'll take questions if I have time. No, are you okay? Yeah. You said there is a different the difference so it's officially the same intervention in both countries but the approach to the co-design has been slightly different so the infrastructure is the same um, the co-design in Indonesia took a lot longer and the participants reflected that it was more detailed in Indonesia and a little bit more organic in Fiji it's been more of a step-by-step -step approach one of the reasons for that might be because Indonesia was the first country that the program worked in and there was a lot of learning and adjusting and then by the time we started in Fiji it was there was a lot more understanding of what worked and what didn't work so that was the main difference between the two. Is there any potential to use this framework for other infrastructure that maybe not specifically focused for infrastructure but more practical? Yeah, absolutely. It's been used in, um, so for, in, in a school setting. So no, so no infrastructure has been implemented, but more of a, um, I think it, I can't remember the name of the study, but um, an intervention around changing the way, ways that teachers engage with their students, for example. So it's more similar to the hospital setting because you've got a, a very tangible institution, but it's, but there's no infrastructure involved. So, yeah. Yep. Really good question. And it's really hard to tell who you missed because you don't hear from them. What we heard from some of the participants were that, um, do you actually, do you mean in, a, in a, this study or do you mean in the RISE program itself? Uh, Okay, yeah, well, we couldn't, so it was all done remotely um, with the assistance of, of our, the RISE program country staff, so the Indonesian Fiji staff. Um, we found it really hard to reach um, migrant workers. Um, and I think that was, that was a group that the participants sort of identified that we possibly missed. Um, of course, we, you always miss the hardest to reach people um, unless you've got people on the ground, literally banging on every door. So we definitely miss people. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
that's absolutely something we had to take into account. And in Indonesia, the data was collected by the RISE program staff, the interviews, I mean. In Fiji, we were able to engage a local university team who were completely independent of RISE. Um, and there's still room for bias there because they're introduced by the program staff. Um, bias is there, that's the... <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Now for the last presentation is water insecurity is positively associated with food insecurity in low and middle income countries by Hilary Bettencourt. Hilary, please. <laughs> This one here. Okay. Yeah. Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Dr. Hilary Bethencourt, and I work with Dr. Sierra Young's research group at Northwestern University. And I'm excited to share with you today some research findings from a recent study using nationally representative data to test the relationship between water insecurity and food insecurity in 25 low. Thank you, low and middle income countries. This work is part of a collaboration with researchers from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the University of South Carolina using data collected via the Gallup World Poll. So I will begin by sharing some background information. We know that food insecurity and undernourishment have long been critical global health issues. And no doubt the COVID-19 pandemic contributed to a rise in food insecurity and undernourishment globally. Most of the world's undernourished populations reside in Asian, African, and Latin American countries, suggesting that this issue is especially critical in low and middle income countries. There are many drivers of food insecurity, including climate change and related increases in drought and flooding, economic downturns, war and conflict, poverty and structural inequalities, and numerous other factors. But one of the less appreciated potential drivers of food insecurity is water insecurity, meaning problems with water access, use, and stability. Of course, we know that both too little and too much water can make it difficult to grow food or cash crops or to raise livestock. But even for those who aren't far farmers and who are not trying to produce their own food, there are a number of pathways through which water insecurity could exacerbate food insecurity. For example, insufficient water or interruptions in water supply could prevent people from being able to cook or prepare meals, causing them to have to reduce their meals or skip meals, leading to reduced food quantity. Or it could prevent households from cooking more nutritious foods that require substantial water to prepare, such as whole grains and legumes, causing households to resort to less water intensive, but also less nutritious foods like refined grains and other processed foods. Furthermore, if households end up having to spend more of their income to obtain safe or sufficient water, that could leave them with less money for purchasing food. Also, for households having to travel long distances to their water source, water collection can become a huge time commitment, preventing household members from engaging in income generating opportunities that might provide means for purchasing food. However, our understanding of this relationship between water insecurity and food insecurity is still quite limited for a number of reasons. First, few studies have been conducted using nationally representative data. The few studies that have used nationally representative, representative data have relied on, what, on measures of whether or not a household has access to at least basic drinking water and or the distance between the home and the water source. But a comprehensive measure of water insecurity should also consider whether that water source to which a household has access provides stable and sufficient water for everyday consumption and domestic needs, like food preparation. After all, access to an improved water source near the home doesn't guarantee that the water 
is always there when needed. Additionally, we know that both water and food insecurity are closely tied with poverty. It remains unclear to what degree water insecurity might relate to food insecurity independently of socioeconomic factors, as many studies are only bivariate correlations and do not adjust for known socioeconomic confounders. The objectives of our study, therefore, were to use nationally representative data on individual experiences with water insecurity and food insecurity to first quantify the degree to which water insecurity and food insecurity co-occur, and second, test whether these insecurities relate to each other independently of socioeconomic factors. To do this, we collected data in late 2020 to early 2021 via the Gallup World Poll. Complete data were available for 31,755 adults aged 15 years and older in 25 low and middle income countries representing Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, Asia, and Latin American regions. Water insecurity was measured using a newly developed, validated, and cross-culturally equivalent instrument for measuring individual experiences with water access, use, and stability. This instrument is referred to as IWISE for short, excuse the uh, um, formatting issues <laughs> from Mac to PC. This scale measures whether or not participants in the last 12 months have experienced a variety of emotional disturbances or disruptions to their daily lives. This is, includes water, worry about their water, anger about their water situation, being unable to wash hands or prepare food or going all day without going to bed without water, having no water whatsoever. These 12 items are scored on a Likert-like scale ranging from zero to three for responses of never, ranging all the way up to in almost every month. The scores for each of these items are summed and we used a score of 12 or greater to define water insecurity. Food insecurity was measured using the eight item food insecurity experience scale referred to as the FIES for short. We used a Roche model to obtain cross country equivalent estimates of the probability that an individual experienced moderate to severe food insecurity based on their affirmations to the eight items on the food insecurity scale. We classified food insecurity as a Roche estimated equated probability parameter of 0.5 or greater. Here's what we found with these data. With regard to our first objective of quantifying the co-occurrence of water insecurity and food insecurity, we estimated the prevalence of water insecurity ranged from 14.8% in Asia to 34.4% in Sub-Saharan Africa. Of those who experienced water insecurity, over 60% also experienced food insecurity in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Latin America. With regard to our second objective, a multivariate, multivariable logistic regression model estimated that experiencing water insecurity in the previous year was associated with a two to three fold higher odds of experiencing concurrent moderate to severe food insecurity even after adjusting for socioeconomic covariates, including per capita household income, reported difficulty getting by on household income, and the degree to which individuals felt that their lives were disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. When running these same multivariable logistic regression models in, in countries separately, we observed that water insecurity was independently associated with food insecurity in most of these 25 low and middle income countries. What can we conclude from these findings? Our study results suggest the concurrent experiences of water insecurity and food insecurity are common in these low and middle income countries. Importantly, in most countries, these insecurities are related independently of key socioeconomic factors like income and difficulty getting by on income. It is important to emphasize that because these data are cross-sectional, we cannot determine causality. 
Therefore, future studies need to examine if and how water insecurity is truly exacerbating food insecurity in these and other nations. Future research is also needed to examine the pathways through which water insecurity could potentially cause or exacerbate food insecurity in different contexts. Such work is going to require that we measure and monitor water insecurity along with food insecurity in more and ideally all countries around the world. Measurements of water insecurity can easily be collected in, cross, in a cross-culturally equivalent manner using the water insecurity experience scales, like the one used in this study. Overall, the broader body of research suggests that water problems could be creating barriers to food access and preparation. Existing research, along with our study results, suggests that policies and intervention programs aim to improve food insecurity in low and middle income countries should also be considering and addressing water insecurity simultaneously. Failure to address these insecurities simultaneously could lead to incomplete or ineffective interventions. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. We would like to acknowledge the support we've received from the Carnegie Corporation and the United States Agency for International Development. We would like to also invite you all to take a look at the water insecurity experiences scales at hwise.org. And please feel free to email me or Dr. Sarah Young with any questions about this research. Thank you very much. That's right. So we're we're measuring people's experiences with water with regard to their everyday consumption and domestic uses. So that's going to be the water that they're drinking, the water that they're using to bathe, wash their hands, to wash clothes, as well as emotional, some of their emotional responses to that water situation. So yeah, it's, it's the blue water. Mm. That is such a great point. So yes, what we are seeing, we are, this is one little piece of a really big issue. And so on a larger scale, we know that either drought or flooding, whether we're talking about water scarcity or major water events that cause flooding are gonna cause issues with raising livestock and growing crops. And that's where the soil moisture comes in. So that's the whole like food production issue. What we're looking at is then, okay, even apart from that on the day-to-day, -day, are individuals that have problems on a day-to-day -day basis, just getting enough water to cook with, to drink, are they experiencing more water, more food insecurity potentially as a result for, of that? And of course, like I said, this is cross-sectional data. We can only talk about associations, but there's good reason and a large, a growing body of qualitative research too, that suggests that households, when we, if there's an interruption in their water supply, they're suddenly not able to cook the food that's available because they have whole grains and legumes and that requires a lot of water. Or they have to switch to eating refined grain porridge that doesn't require as much, as much water. So there's so many different components and of course we need to be addressing all of them.
That's a really great question. So we actually, so in this study, we were adjusting for gender, but we, we did not look at interactions by gender. And I think that that would be a really interesting future area of research. I will say that we've been looking at, we've disaggregated the water insecurity data by gender, expecting that we would find more water insecurity among women overall. And that's the case in some places, but we also find a lot of variation across different countries where unexpectedly there are some areas where men tend to have higher water insecurity, or at least report more experiences with it. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to piece apart, both with the water insecurity stuff. And I think it would be really interesting also to look at potential, like, are these relationships between water insecurity and food insecurity potentially stronger among women, since in a lot of contexts, they're the ones responsible, not only for collecting the water, but also for collecting the food. So that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and we just segregate the data for uh, I saw a big country in South America that I think I know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so there are places that are really dry areas and yeah. naturally. So mm -hmm. if you ask the same questions in the south or in the northeast of the country, you're gonna have totally different results. So how do you uh, control for that? That's a really good question. So one of the limit one of the limitations of this data from Gallup World Poll is that the sample is not large enough to disaggregate at the regional level within the country. So we can say as a whole on the national level, the same way that food insecurity measures tend to be at the, at the national level and not down at the, the regional level. Um, so I agree that there's definitely probably variation within countries that we're not picking up. That said, when we're looking across countries, we're still seeing a strong relationship between water insecurity and food insecurity, both in drier countries and less dry countries. So, um, so it seems like the relationship might not be as strong, but could potentially still be there. But definitely, this is an area of future research. And I hope that that more researchers will continue to examine um, not only these relationships, but also try to understand these pathways and these potential interactions. Yes. Okay, so I would just add that we will very soon in our hot little hands have geotag coordinates for all of these data. Uh, I don't think that's people, but Hillary is learning and other people know. <laughs> And we're happy to like kind of open open up the, the black box to be like some of the panel stuff. So if you're interested in you can do that. Great. Uh, we do have five minutes. If you have questions for the other speakers, too, you can add it right now. They're here, waiting to take more questions. So that's you, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Oh, 